Good evening, good day, and good morning, viewers of our program, Straight Talk. Let me welcome you once again to another in our series, Straight Talk programs. We hope that you have found all of our programs so far of interest to you. And we also hope that you would have shared these programs with your friends and colleagues. We look forward to all the criticisms. We look forward to all the suggestions you may have. And we also look forward to you making contributions to the discussions that we have on these Straight Talk programs. If you have a topic that you believe ought to be discussed on this program, please feel free to share those topics with us so that we can gain a much wider audience on the basis of topics suggested by viewers. Today, or this week, we will deal with a subject called the importance of linkages. That is to say, the importance of links, the importance of connections, or the interrelationship and the interaction between different political and social phenomena. We call it the importance of linkages. Throughout history, politicians, economists, social thinkers, and even philosophers have sought to make links between different socioeconomic formations, various social events, and other social, political, and economic phenomena, and what they perceive to be antecedents of the past and prognosis for the future. And so they make these linkages also in order to put in context events which may be happening of a current nature or events that could be unfolding in the future. So linkages could be important, but linkages could also be of a negative nature because people might be making linkages on issues that bear no relevance whatsoever to the topic under discussion or making linkages mainly for the purposes of political convenience in order to advance an argument that actually has no merit or an argument in order to achieve some objective that may not be in the interest of society or people as a whole. Now we will talk this week about linking the general with the specific, meaning general issues, and I will talk about that briefly, and specific issues. For example, a general issue is the standard or the cost of living. Standard of living and cost of living are issues that capture or encapsulate a number of other subtitular issues or a number of issues that are subservient to the general issue. So that when, for example, we speak about the cost of living, inherent in the cost of living are things like my phone bill, my electricity bill, my transportation bill, my rent, etc. These are what you may describe as the specific issues in the general issue. Now, the question is, how do we deal with the general issues as distinct from the specific issues? Let us use another example. We may talk about the general issue of the struggle for democracy. Democracy is a very broad topic. There's economic democracy, there's social democracy, and there are many other expressions of democracy, political democracy also. There are many other expressions of democracy that fall within the general framework of democracy. 
But when we relate these issues to, let's say, our own situation in Guyana, because this is what we must always do. When we are discussing a topic, we must always seek to contextualize that topic within the situation that we have here in Guyana. In other words, one cannot discuss the situation in Guyana or any particular subject that is of interest to people without looking at the general situation. So we are free in our discussions to discuss specific issues, but to put it in the context of the general issues. So for today's discussion, the general issue will be the fight for democracy, the struggle to maintain all the democratic gains that the people of Guyana have gained over the past years. Now, I'm sure you will agree with me that many of the gains that the Guyanese people have won over the years were not gains that were dropped, let's say, from a tree or dropped from the skies. Many of these gains came as a result of long and difficult struggles from our parents and foreparents. For example, the struggle for free and fair elections. This is not something that occurred overnight. This is not something that suddenly dropped in the laps of the present generation. This came about as a result of long and difficult struggles by many who preceded us. In other words, what we're talking about here is adult suffrage, the right of a citizen to elect freely without let or hindrance the government of their choice. In the past, that right was only allocated to those who owned property. If you owned land, if you owned a house, if you had some form of property or the other, then you had the right to vote. Those who did not own any of these things had no right to vote. In other words, democracy was in inverted commas for a few and not for the many, not for the majority. And so year after year, the people of Guyana, led mainly or principally by the People's Progressive Party, eventually won the right to vote at elections, what is called universal adult suffrage. Universal mean the right to vote in its universality. In other words, everyone, not just a few, now have the right to vote and to elect which political party they would like to administer the affairs of the country. So, the fight for free and fair elections is part and parcel of the general fight for democracy in our country. And that's where we see the linkage, the link between fight for free and fair elections and democracy. The question of the rule of law is also a manifestation of what ought to exist in a democracy. Rule of law meaning that there are laws in the country that have been long established or of current value, but the laws must be maintained and observed by all. So rule of law mean that the laws must rule above everything else. And that's why we would hear people say that no one is above the law. And that is also why we have what is called in some countries a constitutional court or a high court or an appeal court or in our case in the Caribbean, a Caribbean court of justice to adjudicate on the democratic rights 
of the people within the jurisdiction. So you have the national jurisdiction and you have the regional jurisdiction. In this case, Guyana has the national court or the lower court, which is the high court or the supreme court and the appeal court. Those are the lower courts. When you go to the higher courts now, you're talking about the Caribbean Court of Justice, and that's where the story ends. So the fight for fair and fair elections is not an isolated issue, it's not a standalone issue. It is all part and parcel of the fight for democracy, the rule of law, and the upholding of the Constitution. Why? Because all of those issues are embedded or inherent in the Constitution of our country. And the Constitution, as we know, is supreme. There's nothing that can be or there's nothing that can be above the Constitution. That is the supreme law of the land. So when we fight, and here again is the linkage that we refer to, when we fight for democracy, we also fight for other gains, either that we've lost or we would like to recapture. So the fight for democracy, as I said, is not an isolated issue. When we fight it for democracy and when we fight it for free and fair elections, and this is where I'd like to put emphasis, when we are fighting for free and fair elections or in the fight for free and fair elections, what is it that we're fighting against? We are fighting against corruption. We're fighting against quandamania. We're fighting against nepotism. We're fighting against anything that is unconstitutional. And we're fighting for the rule of law. So let me repeat that. The fight for free and fair elections is not an isolated or a standalone issue. It is, at the same time, a fight for or a fight against corruption, a fight against quandamania, a fight against nepotism fight against anything that is unconstitutional and a fight to obtain or to uphold the rule of law. They are all interconnected. So when people go out, when people write, when people speak, that you know, I am fighting for free and fair elections. All that is well and good. But it's not so much the form of the fight, it's the content of the fight. The form of the fight, yes, is for free and fair elections, and that is in order, especially if it, the people are deprived of that right. But the content, the socio-economic content of that fight is what is extremely important. Because if we just want elections and if we just want free and fair elections the question is what happens after let's say the worst case scenario you are fighting for free and fair elections the worst case scenario is you do not get free and fair elections you end up with a dictatorship if in that fight for free and fair elections you are not focusing on issues such as violations of the Constitution, violations of human rights, all other violations of people's rights, democratic rights, human rights, social and political rights, the fundamental rights that are enshrined in the United Nations Charter, and in the Guyana Constitution, if you are fighting for free and fair elections and in the worst case scenario, heavens forbid that that does not happen in Guyana, we end up with rigged elections and a dictatorship. And if you have not factored in those elements in the fight, 
then in the aftermath of the elections, when you end up with the dictatorship, and you did not have those elements under advisement or under, under consideration, then you may very well end up frustrated. Because you will end up saying, well, you know, we fought for free and fair elections, we didn't get it, and that's it. No, no, no. On the other hand, let's again take another hypothetical situation, which is the best case scenario. You fight for free and fair elections, you win free and fair elections, the party that you voted for win the elections. What happens next? You then look forward to that party implementing its manifesto promises and implementing many of the things which you were deprived of under the previous administration. And you end up doing away with many of the things which you fought against in the course of the fight for fair and fair elections, things like corruption, things like squandermania, things like violations of the Constitution, things like violations of the rule of law. In a new government that takes over, having won free and fair elections, the expectation of the people who voted unanimously for that party that is now in the government, you look forward to those issues being addressed, being gotten away with, or being implemented on the basis of what they promised to the manifesto. So it's not only a question of shouting for elections. It's also the question of what happens next, what happens after. The content, the social and economic content of the fight for free and fair elections is equally important as the fight for free and fair elections. We come back again to the question of linkage. These issues are all linked. And it's important that we see the interconnection and interaction between, in this particular case, in this situation that we're in here now, we see the connection and interaction between fighting for free and fair elections and being also in favor of a fundamental change in the policies of the previous administration and a change in favor of those issues which you went and voted for from the new government. So that is what binds us together. It should not be just anti-APNU-AFC. We cannot just be anti-APNU-AFC. That is important to be against the programs and the policies of the APNU AFC. But we come back to the same question, that in being anti-APNU AFC, we must also have certain fundamental social and economic objectives in mind. Because if it is just a question of anti, there arises the question of what is the pro. So on the one hand, you are against, but the question also is what are you in favor of? So being against is one thing. Being in favor of what follows, especially with a change or a positive change of government, is equally important. This brings us to the next question which is, we should not be in favor of change for the sake of change. This is precisely what happened in 2015 at the election that was held in May of that year. People just wanted a change, having had the PPPC in government for 23 years. Many knew nothing other than the PPP government. And so they grew accustomed to certain things, benefits, and they took a lot of things for granted. But you know, it's human to also want to change, to try something new, so to speak, without thinking 
about what this new something would bring. And that's what is called normal human behavior. So when 2015 came and people said, you know, it, I think it's about time we had a change and they voted for the change. Some of the PPP supporters who bolted from the PPP on the basis of promises made by the AFC and the APNU eventually began to realize that to make changes for the sake of a change is not the best thing. That's not the route to go. Because change for the sake of change is meaningless and lacks what I will describe as substance. Nowadays, especially in election season, a lot of people are talking about change. And I'm not imputing anything uh, hazardous or negative to any of the parties that have just come on the political scene. That is for the electorate to decide on polling day. But I must make the point that in these days, we are seeing the mushrooming of a number of new political parties on the scene. Now in a democracy, it is quite acceptable for new political parties to emerge. Even if they might have enough members to fit in a 14-seater minibus. If that's all the membership they have, of course they're free. To have those 14 members in the 14-seat minibus form the political party, no problem. But you know, the thing is that many of these newcomers on the scene are either charlatans, hustlers, or demagogues that are making promises, promises, and more promises. Now one might argue, theoretically, that with the emergence of new political forces on the electoral stage, it is quite understandable, though not acceptable, for them to make mountains upon mountains of promises. Mountains of promises as high as Roraima, those promises could go. But it's always a question of trust. It's a question of trust, it's a question of experience, is a question of who the best, according to your judgment, to take control of the reins of government. We know that promises are free to be made. You can make all the promises that people can want to make. It's VAT free. You don't have to pay taxes on promises and it's freely sold and freely bought in the general context of the prevailing circumstances where propaganda now has become a matter of easy come and easy go. So in fighting for change, we have to take these developments into consideration. Who are the new players on the political scene that are hoping to win some seats in the National Assembly. And you have to balance what you feel about them against what you know of the parties that has the experience, the knowledge, the capacity, not only to lead, but to take full grasp of the welfare of the people and the people of the country. We know that the People's Progressive Party has years of experience behind it, that the People's Progressive Party pursued policies that were people-centered. Always the people were at the center of every policy of the PPP. 
whether they're sugar workers, rice farmers, small, medium, and big size businessmen, entrepreneurs, youth, students, women, children. These were the these were at the center of the programs and policies of the PPP. And that is why everywhere I particularly go in the city of Georgetown, and as I move around the country, I would hear people shouting and calling out to me to say, Mr. Rohi, we have to do something to get these people out of office. By something, I suppose they mean voting them out of office. And they want that as early as they can. So we have to link the fight in the courts, what is called the legal battles. We have to fight, we have to link the fight in the parliament, what is called the parliamentary struggle. And we have to link the fight at the political level to the struggle for free and fair elections and the struggle for democracy. So it's a top down as well as a bottom up. The fight goes horizontally and it goes vertically as well. For many weeks now, or I should say months, the focus of the fight has been in the courts, the legal battle. But you know, the legal battle doesn't always turn out to be to your advantage, as we have seen in this country, where the courts have taken positions that are not necessarily popular. And one may be, they may very well argue that the court is not there to make decisions or rulings that are popular. They may make rulings that are unpopular. But when the court makes a ruling that is unpopular, there are repercussions at the political and social level. If the people do not accept it, and if the people reject it, then it now moves to the political level. It becomes now a political issue. And in the case where the parliament is functioning, it becomes a parliamentary issue as well, because it's in the parliament laws are made, and it's in the parliament that laws can be made to change the laws to make it much more amenable to the people's interests. And when it comes to political, you know, this is where the political parties would now advance their own political interests based on their constituents to fight their respective battles. And so I come back to the question of linking the general with the specific. All these are specific issues that are linked, that are connected inextricably to the general struggle that is taking place. You also have the question of mass protests that is taking place in many countries around the world, in Hong Kong, in Argentina, in Chile, in Ecuador, in Bolivia, in Lebanon, in Iraq. In those countries, you have masses of people on the streets demanding change and demanding that their voices be heard. And not only that, it's not only the form in their cases, it's also the content. They want to make some fundamental or they want to see some fundamental changes that coincide with their interests and their right to live progressive and a prosperous life. And I would like to emphasize this point that while all these areas of battle are important, whether it's in the parliament, whether it's in the court, or whether it's politically, and while all are linked, including mass struggles, we should bear in mind that we cannot or ought not to depend solely on one of these arenas of struggle to achieve success. In other words, we cannot depend only on the courts to win the fight for free and fair elections and to win the struggle for democracy. There may be gains. And as you know, 
every war is won on the basis of battles. You can win a battle, but you may not win the war. And so, while the general is to win the war, the specific is to win the battles. And while the specific is to win the battles, you're aiming to win the war as well. So, we need to be aware of the fact that we cannot or we ought not to focus exclusively on one of these arenas of struggle. We cannot depend only on the courts to win our long-term objective. We cannot depend on the parliament alone to win our long-term objectives. And we cannot depend only on the political. And by the way, there's also the diplomatic negotiations to win what we are hoping to achieve. You know, as I examined this question, it came to my mind that in 1992, we had a much more difficult struggle than we have now to win free and fair elections. But you know what? Not a single one of those issues went to the court for us to be able to achieve them. For example, the question of counting the votes at the place of poll, which we did not have before. We did not have to fight that battle in the courts. The question of changes in the Elections Commission, a new Elections Commission, a new chairman, etc. We did not have to fight that battle in the courts. The question of overseas observers to observe the elections. We did not have to fight that battle in the courts. In other words, what I'm saying is that many of the reforms that we gained prior to the October 1992 elections, those reforms were not won in the courts as we are seeking, as we have been doing, to win reforms now in the courts. Those achievements were won through political and diplomatic negotiations. Strange but true. Strange but true. Most of those reforms, and I should say almost all the reforms, were won through diplomatic and political negotiations. And at the end of those negotiations, those things were taken to the parliament for the parliament to approve of the changes or of the reforms. Because by the time it arrived at the parliament, it meant that the political parties, principally the People's Progressive Party and the People's National Congress had agreed. And so by the time it arrived in the parliament, there was no problem in having them passed and made into law. But I emphasize the point because I lived through that experience that none of those reform measures were won in the courts. And that's an extremely important observation and experience for us to bear in mind. Because now you have an AP and new AFC government in place and an attorney general who just loves running to the courts, even though he loses most of what he takes to the courts. And that is why I make the point that we cannot, or we ought not to, even though we may be desirable of doing so, that not all the battles are won in the courts, and it is not the best thing to put all your eggs in one basket. That's the point I want to make. It's not the best thing, even when you're fighting for reforms or to gain political advantage for you to put all your eggs in one basket, meaning basket meaning the legal, basket meaning the parliamentary. We have to see the interaction and the interconnection. We have to fight legalistically, we have to fight parliamentarily, we have to fight politically. And we have to link, have to make what is called, I come back to the question of the linkage between all these elements in order to achieve our success. So my friends, the specific that we are focusing on for this period of time until March next year is the question of free and fair elections. The general is maintenance of democracy, the rule of law, and upholding 
everything that is enshrined in our constitution. Here is where the linkage must be. And as I said, the question of change should not be for the sake of change, but we must have not only the form, but the content. What is it we want in the change? What is the substance in the change? What are the specific issues we would like to have were we to win free and fair elections? And this is what soon most of the political parties would be putting to the respective constituents and to the public as a whole. And it, was, it is on that basis that electors will judge, not only on the basis of their manifestos, but on the basis of past performance. And many of us know the overwhelming majority of Guyanese people have experienced, have benefited from the People's Progressive Party track record in government, in the housing sector, in the transportation sector, in the construction sector, in the education sector, in the health sector, in the security sector, social sector. Thousands have benefited. Those policies of the PPP has touched the lives of almost every Guyanese in one way or the other, if not directly, at least indirectly. And it is with that in mind that many of the Guyanese would like to see the PPP returning to office. And that is a decision which the electorate will make on election day and after. Now, it is expected that if the People's Progressive Party, when the People's Progressive Party win the elections, that peace and order will be maintained that the decision of the electorate will be respected, that the outcome and the results will be respected, provided the elections are deemed free and fair, provided the elections are above board, and provided that the Guyanese electorate are satisfied that every vote counted. We would not wish to have a situation like they have in Bolivia as I referred to in a previous uh, straight talk program. So my friends, viewers, let us be on the alert. Let us be on the watch. Let us be vigilant. Let us understand the connection. Let us understand the linkage between the general and the specific, meaning general democracy, specific free and fair elections, and even in free and fair elections, change not for the sake of change, but change with a social and economic content. That is reflective of the desires and the needs of the Guyanese people. Let us meet once again in another Straight Talk program. We will continue discussions on these matters, which we believe are of general interest to our viewers. Thank you very much. Until next time, let us continue the dialogue. Thank you.